Hello, and welcome to the Engage Brain Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by the Lie Detector 2.0. Polygraphs don't work. No, seriously, they don't work. Everyone and their grandma knows how to beat them. But guess what? Now, instead of looking at the physiological responses of the brain, we just look straight at the brain itself. No more proxy measures for brain activity. Well, I guess bold activation is what we're using, and that's still a proxy measure, but we're closer than before. So with the Lie Detector 2.0, we throw you in an fMRI detector, that's a functional magnetic resonance imaging detector, and with 100% accuracy, we can tell if you're lying. Though sometimes we categorize your response, uh, a truthful response, as a lie, when it's really not, but we're working on that. So don't worry, Uh, a few false positives won't hurt. Science has the promise to drastically alter almost every facet of our lives, but do we want it to? Neuroscience has previously contributed to the practice of law with polygraph tests and, more recently, our understanding of human memory and eyewitness testimony. But pushing neuroscience to its limits, though, some have advocated using neuroscience technologies to peer inside the brain and understand an individual's thoughts, in particular, whether they're telling the truth or lying. Today, I speak with Kyle L. Bagley about the application of neuroscience to the field of law, in particular, using brain imaging technology to tell truth from fiction. So I'll be interested to hear more on uh, the like focused research on the topic. Uh, but can you tell me uh, what got you interested in law? Um, I mean, I've I like following like a lot of the Supreme Court cases, mm-hmm. and that's really interesting to me. And I think the biggest thing though is that I served on the honor council here. At oh, for, yeah. For, for for four semesters. Oh wow. So I've served on a great variety of honor council trials, and yeah, just thinking about like the ethical and philosophical and like considerations that go with how to deal with people who violate the honor code here yeah well what we can do to like hold them accountable but then make sure that they're restored to the community and they won't do it again yeah because it's more about uh restorative justice rather than punishment yeah yeah we really we really really focus on the restoration aspect of it yeah and that's not something that i think is common across uh, even other places with honor codes, it feels more like you did something bad, yeah. so we have to punish you, not like mm-hmm. uh, we want you to learn from this mistake or this mm-hmm. process and uh, kind of come back so that you are um, you know, f- full-fledged uh, and respected member of the community. Again. Yeah, one of... Which semester was it? I think last, last fall I went to Hamilton College where they were organizing like a kind of conference of like honor councils from different schools. And like... A lot of the schools there were like referring to like their resolutions as like sanctions. And, like, oh, yeah. Just viewing it in that way, and we we like refuse to call what we do sanctions. It's like resolutions because we're more aimed at restoration rather than like punishment. Yeah. Did you find any other colleges there that were similar in that they found resolutions or? I mean, a lot of them had similar like ideals and like honor codes and things like that. But I think we were the people most focused on restoration, restorative justice. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, something I should have brought up, uh, restorative justice in terms of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, but uh, while, while we're on the topic of the brain, what have you been finding so far in terms of the brain and, and uh, law or, or uh, applying mm-hmm. kind of justice? Well, I've kind of focused a lot on uh, using fMRI as lie detectors, which mm-hmm. is what my major project was on. Yeah. Yeah, it seems, it seems like it has potential, but we're not quite there yet Right. in terms of it being accurate enough. Yeah, so what kind of tasks have they asked people to do in the scanner to use the Mm -hmm. scanner as a lie detector? A lot of things they've done is, like, kind of set up, like, mock crime scenarios and, like, have some people be the criminals and some people be innocent. And then they'd, like, ask them a bunch of questions about the scenario and, like, try to tell if they were lying or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so people experience something and then you ask them, like, oh, was the 
surrounding white or blue. Right. Or, mm-hmm. And so, and sometimes sometimes they're told to lie versus tell the truth. Yeah. That's the question. And then the, and the researchers analyzing them don't know what which one they were told, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and what is the finding in terms of the brain when it's lying versus when it's telling the truth? Well, they have they have found areas of the frontal lobes, especially that do that can be associated with dishonest behavior. But the problem is that even though they're able to accurately identify the people who are being dishonest, they also flag a lot of people who are being honest as dishonest. Mm-hmm. So, so false, false essentially, positives. Yeah. Essentially, they have high specificity, but lows. Sorry, high sensitivity, low specificity. Yeah, yeah. So they can catch all the liars. They just are kind of a dragnet and get some innocent yeah. people, too. Yeah, and in terms of our criminal justice system, that's not really what you want to be right. doing. Yeah, you want to get all the people that you want to get, but dragging a bunch of innocent people in behind bars right. is kind of a guess. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, what was I going to... Oh, so have you come across any of like the kind of pseudoscience-y versions of uh, lying? So like you can look, tell somebody's lying because they uh, move their eyes in a particular direction? Um, a few of the studies have also like used polygraphs, which okay. use like, skin conductance and things like that. Mm-hmm. But I haven't seen anything like just like watching them, like, okay. how they move. Yeah, I, the thought... I, I mix it up, so the... So this goes back to the neural myth of uh, like the left and right hemispheres being these con- kind of completely separate things. Mm-hmm. So our right hemisphere being more uh, involved in creativity, and so if someone is lying, it's a creative act, and so they move their eyes in a direction mm-hmm. that indicates the use of the right mm-hmm. uh, frontal lobe. Uh, I, I can never remember, because I think it's even wrong the way that it's told traditionally in mm-hmm. terms of eye movement. Yeah. Um, and then another one I saw actually last night was the show Limitless, uh, mm-hmm. if you're uh, familiar with that. No. So the, the 2011 movie with Bradley Cooper, you take a pill and it basically makes you uh, superhuman. Uh, and you like it's the again the 10 percent myth like you can access your whole brain. Yeah. Uh, and in the show uh, the other night they um, took the pill and was able to tell if someone was lying because uh, there's a um, flow of blood to their nose kind of the Pinocchio effect they mm. called it uh, and on the pill they were able to have super perception of the vision mm-hmm. um, visual system to see the uh, blood moving to the nose Yeah. Uh, so I, I kind of think of the Pinocchio effect uh, in the brain uh, that uh, blood mm-hmm. moves to particular parts of the brain when yeah. someone is yeah. lying uh, but you mentioned your BuzzFeed quiz uh, have you had any response uh, to that from family or friends that uh, have seen that on, on BuzzFeed um, I don't no, uh, no one's interested in learning about uh, fMRI as a de- lie detector. <laughs> I, it's hard to tell. I, uh, I guess I don't have it. Yeah, I guess with BuzzFeed, it's hard to tell like how many views you have, really. Yeah. Like the only measure of articles that I've seen are like comments. Right. Yeah, yeah because it's not like. Um, I suppose if you had posted it on um, Facebook or something like that, mm. people might like it or something. Yeah, I'm just not on social media um, really yeah. at all. Yeah. So. Yeah, a little bit harder to, to do that then. Um, but uh, if we're uh, looking at uh, this area and why we talked about it in class was is because it has such practical implications for right. uh, us and, and society. Do you think that there's any um, area that's uh, developing or needs more development? Um, I definitely think tr- keep trying to like get the technology better would be good. And mm-hmm. even if it's even if it's never perfect, it can always. I think I had mentioned this in the debate, but it, it can always just be something you consider using. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be like, we have fMRI evidence, so ignore everything else and just go by this. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, since it does seem to be able to detect lies versus um, truth, mm-hmm. it seems like it's a, p- a potential. Uh, I would like to see more like naturalistic versions of this, uh, so mm-hmm. not telling people to lie versus uh, Right, yeah. Lying. A lot of the experiments have been like college students who like they have this like whole task that they're like setting up they haven't really done much experiments with like real life Mm -hmm. at least from that end they have they have like had people play as jurors Mm -hmm. and they would like give them the criminal scenario and show them different kinds of evidence Mm -hmm. and a lot of the times the fMRI evidence doesn't really sway them as much as they thought it would okay yeah, because what was the Christmas tree effect someone brought up, and then like with the oohs and ahs when they saw the pretty colored brains. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I think maybe it's part of like not being even able to understand it in the first yeah. place. So like 
Uh, it's like when the uh, mechanic takes me back into the garage and like points at the engine to tell mm-hmm. me what's wrong. It, it's like, e- okay, right. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not a mechanic. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think that that could be the same thing that we see with uh, mm-hmm. fMRI evidence. Right. Um, okay, I believe you. Um, mm-hmm. But do you think that there's any one real important thing uh, that you should communicate about applying uh, neuroscience to the law? Um, well, another aspect of my research that I've been focusing on is looking like how youth brains differ from adult brains, mm-hmm. and that's actually been used a lot recently, in, especially in terms of like big Supreme Court decisions, where in 2005 they outlawed the death penalty for minors, Yeah, and then in 2012 they outlawed um, life, in, like, uh, life in prison without the chance of parole for minors, and then just this year they made that decision retroactive. Oh, so, so a bunch of get stu- um, students, youths on, uh, without parole are now able to be paroled? I mean, it's not, it's not like they're just going to, like, commute their sentence automatically, but they're go- they have to consider now, like, has this person matured enough and have they, like, done enough time that maybe we can consider releasing them? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I was just at the Cognitive Neuroscience Society meeting, and one of the Young Investigator Awards was Adriana Galvan, uh, who's a researcher at UCLA, and she studies the adolescent brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of her work apparently has been used in uh, the Supreme Court decisions on, Mm -hmm. like, how to treat uh, adolescents. And uh, the quote that's uh, stuck in my mind from her uh, in her talk was that adolescents aren't big kids, and they're also not mini adults. Right. They're, they're like kind a, of their own thing. Their own thing, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so we have to try to understand how they are unique uh, mm-hmm. and what that means in terms of their behavior. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with the frontal lobes. Like mm-hmm. most of the rest of the brain is pretty developed by the time you get to adolescence, but the frontal lobe's still growing a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And she was uh, saying that what we look at or what we think about as risky behavior in adolescence mm-hmm. maybe is more uh, of a thing that the brain is trying to do in order to develop the frontal lobe. Right. Uh, so it was, uh, I think she called it like novelty seeking. And mm-hmm. so a lot of novelty seeking looked like risky decisions. Yeah. Uh, and how that uh, brain is, is developing at that time uh, mm-hmm. in order to kind of shift it in, in one direction or another. Right, right. Uh, and then there was another interesting thing where she was saying, like, oh, well, what if we, like, actually look at the brains? Uh, if the brain looks, adolescent brain looks more like an adult brain or less mm-hmm. like an adult brain. And over um, the adolescent years, there was, like, this shift in risky decision-making as related to um, structure. So mm-hmm. it was kind of like, throw your hands up in the air. You didn't really know <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. What, what to make of it. It was kind of heads or tails. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I think we'll s- start to... Uh, wrap up here do you think that there um, is promise for uh, trying to to understand the adolescent brain better and uh, applying fMRI lie detection yeah I I think there's definitely promise in both those cases I think I think there's already been a lot done with the adolescent brain in terms of like realizing that it's very different and that maybe they can't control their actions as much as adults can Mm -hmm. so maybe that should affect their sentencing yeah and then as I said fMRI lie detection I think as we learn more about the brain and as our technology gets better it can be more useful yeah yeah it's a definitely an area that i want to start taking my research in terms of understanding memory and how Mm -hmm. memory plays a role in uh people's kind of guilt or or innocence in criminal cases how much can we actually expect uh we already have kind of like uh, thrown out eyewitness detection as being the only thing in cases Mm -hmm. Uh, but how can we how much can we expect like an individual accused of something to remember about a particular scenario. Right. Uh, all right. So uh, we'll wrap up here by asking uh, if you have uh, anything to promote uh, coming up in the future here. Well, I'm in the Haverford Bryn Mawr Orchestra, mm-hmm. and we have our spring concert on Friday, April 15th at 8 p.m. in Marshall Auditorium at Haverford. All right. Well, uh, good luck with that, and thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you. about uh, neuro, neuro law, the neuroscience and uh, law. Uh, it was such an interesting and uh, potentially uh, drastically life-altering or life-changing uh, new field uh, in uh, science. 
Uh, so much so that uh, it was a debate in our cognitive neuroscience class. Uh, we have uh, had two had two debates this semester. Uh, our first one was on the application of uh, neuroscience and neuroscientific understanding to education, and the second one, uh, just a few uh, weeks ago, was uh, the application of neuroscience and neuroscientific understanding to law. Uh, so, uh, as a class, uh, we talked about things like uh, to what extent can uh, brain dysfunction alleviate criminal punishment. Uh, we uh, thought about uh, whether sentencing or rehabilitation regulations should be influenced by neuroscience. Uh, we wanted to know uh, who is permitted access to the images of a person's brain. Uh, we wanted to know whether our understanding of the brain uh, could speak to sentencing for uh, adolescents in particular. Uh, as I spoke with Kyle about uh, what are the differences in an adolescent's brain uh, that might uh, kind of guide your understanding of whether uh, someone should be sentenced as a child or as an, uh, an adult. Uh, one kind of really interesting uh, discussion that we had was uh, if people's brains are developing so differently, uh, rather than using an arbitrary marker like uh, someone's age, say 18, what if we could kind of look at someone's uh, brains to uh, try to uh, understand where they are developmentally? Uh, so uh, uh, turning to the last two segments, uh, Jake's Jams, nothing uh, today. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, kind of cut that one short. Uh, and then uh, turning to the last segment, Twitter Tweets or uh, Reader Mail, uh, nothing so far. Uh, we're um, still looking for uh, more uh, tweets or, or emails. Uh, you can tweet me at uh, Engage Brain, and uh, you can email me at uh, Engage Brain Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, so thanks so much for listening. This has been the Engage Brain Podcast. Bye.